Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. You are my light and my salvation. You restore me and lead me for your glory. I long to dwell in your house forever. What a blessing it is to be together. Good morning again, church family. My name is John. If I haven't met you yet, I'd love to meet you sometime. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we would just be encouraged to know that you came. And so please let us know that. Also, if you've been here for 60 years, we're encouraged that you came as well. So thank you for that. We do love everyone uh, as we worship together. Now, one of the hardest things for me growing up was learning this concept of patience. Uh, we live in this culture of immediate gratification, and it's hard to learn to wait. Even our world, our flesh itself perpetuates this idea. We hate waiting on anything, right? Uh, we have microwave dinners. We can't wait on it to be cooked. We spend hundreds of dollars to skip the line at Disney World, right? Uh, we even will buy a new phone just to shave microseconds off of the browser loading time that we can't wait any longer. Like, it's amazing. I, I was just thinking about this with my phone here. I, amazing how I can get frustrated when it buffers at all when I'm watching a movie streaming to my phone in the middle of nowhere, right? Like how, when, when computers used to sound like this, Right? Okay, all right, I think we've had enough of that. Right? That's whew, some trauma from that, I think. But, but that, you, you remember that, right? And you had to wait and wait, and then it was like 45 minutes to download anyway. So we're so spoiled. But here's what that culture of like faster and quicker and now can do to us. It can deeply affect our relationship with God. Because I know how hard it is for me like to stop and to slow down enough to just enjoy God and to, to be in his word and to read and to pray and meditate. It can be hard because we're so driven towards speed. There's always the pull of, of whatever game or episode or movie or whatever else video we can have that we feel is way more entertaining in fact, studies show it's rewiring our brains because of how we have this speed in our lives. But it also affects our relation with God in, in another way. We can easily get really frustrated with God whenever things don't turn out quickly enough the way we think they should. When problems and struggles don't seem to resolve quickly. Like we have to sit with that pain longer than we think we should. Or we don't see justice coming as swiftly as we think it should. Or we're waiting on a spouse or waiting on a baby. And so similar to last week, today in Psalm 70, we're gonna see King David be very honest about his struggle with having to wait on God. Waiting on God to come through for him in his time of need. But we'll also be challenged with what our response should be even in the midst of the temptation towards impatience. What should we do? How should we Respond. And so let's ask God for help towards that right now. Lord, we need you to teach us, show us, change us. We need you, Holy Spirit, to speak through your word directly to the corners of our hearts that we might have neglected or might have hidden to show us what you want us to see today and how to live in light of it for your glory, in light of grace. Thank you, God. 
Help us in Jesus' name, amen. And so look with me now at Psalm 70. This is the next psalm in our series, picking up in order. Psalm 70 will again show us David's heart. Look at it here. The heading to this choir master of David, we know he wrote it then, for the memorial offering. Verse one, make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great but I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. So this psalm is is nearly a replica of a portion of Psalm 40. David wrote that as well. There's a bit of modification here and there. And, and, and you notice in the superscription that it says something about a memorial offering, a memorial, and it's like a word that means remembrance. So in in other words, what David did here, probably both for himself, but also for others, was to remind himself and others of these truths that he had already written and that he needed to remember in this moment. And he wanted everybody to sing this so they could remember these kind of things as well, that who God is, what he said he is, all of that's true, no matter what you're facing. So it's a memorial And notice there's a couple things here we can learn about God from this psalm. First, he said it very clearly that God is our help and our deliverer. That's the truths that he's wanting to remind himself and others about. God is our help and our deliverer. He said it directly there at the end of verse five. But if you notice, it was also in verse one, right? Make haste, O God, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Now, we don't use that word make haste very often. It means hurry up. Don't delay. Go quickly. He said it at the end of verse five. Again, Yahweh, do not delay. Even the second line of verse five, he says, make haste. Hasten to me, O God. So he's, he's saying this thing. like This is urgent, God. He said it so many times, there's an urgency in his life, in his heart. These enemies are pressing in really closely. They may be even at his doorstep. And he says, God, you you better hurry up here. I need you to hurry. Yet again, don't forget that he viewed Yahweh as his help and his deliverer. Now, It's easy to believe that phrase, that God is our help and our deliverer. It's easy to remember that when things are going really well in life. Like whenever they interview the guy who scored the the winning touchdown after the game, uh, and he says, man, God came through for us, right? It's easy to say that when you actually win. It's a lot harder, a lot more rare when someone says that after they missed the winning shot, right? And God came through for me today. Like, no, you don't, you don't hear that one. That's again why I love the Psalms, because they're honest. We see it here in David, that he viewed God as his help and his deliverer, even when he was needy. Right? This is so clear right here, that even when he was needy, he still saw God as his help and his deliverer. Verse five says, but I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help, my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Now, we don't know when David wrote this psalm. It could have been when he was banished from Israel, hunted like an animal by those who were aligned with his son. 
That could have been very true about his life at this point where he was living in caves, he was on the run, he was eating what he could scrounge up from the world. Like he would have been needy at that moment. He wouldn't have written this when he was rich in the, in the palace. Like he would, this is when he was needy. And so what he does here is he acknowledges it. He said, I am poor and needy. And it was in that state that he turned to the Lord as his help and his deliverer. Listen, it's okay to acknowledge our neediness before the Lord. In fact, it's okay to acknowledge it before other people. Because it's true of all of us all the time. We're always needy. But but it's okay to do that. It's only our pride that keeps us from doing that. But we can and we should carry our needs to the Lord, especially first because he already knows what they are. You're not informing him of something, reminding him, notifying him. You're not informing him. He already knows. And because he is the one who provides what you need. Just listen to what Jesus had to say about neediness. Matthew 6, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? I mean, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things. Now, here it is. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, notice something about that. He never said he would provide all that you want. But he does promise that he will give us everything we need. Meaning, as you acknowledge your need, he provides your need for you. See, we can trust that God is our help and our deliverer even when we are needy because we know his character and because, like 2 Corinthians 12 says, When we are weak, we're actually strong because it's his strength providing for us. We don't have to stay strong. We don't have to act like we're strong. We can be weak because he's strong for us. So we can call on the Lord as our help and our deliverer, even when we're needy, which is all the time. But also there's a second piece here. Even when we are hurt, we learn from David that we call on him as our help and our deliverer even when we're hurt. We see it in David's cry. Let's look at verses two and three again. He says, let them be put to shame and confusion who seek my life. Let them be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let them turn back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. So whatever the situation was, we know David had been extremely hurt by these people. Like they were literally trying to kill him. They were taking joy in his pain and they said, aha, aha to him. Now, I'm not talking about that nasty drink you get at Target, okay? Like that's, that's not what this is referring to. Which by the way, I'm an equal opportunity offender on that. I don't like any of the spark. So don't think I'm just picking on this one. But that was some, for some reason, my mind went to that for the first one I read this. But what that word in Hebrew means, aha, it's like a gotcha moment. It's like a, a mocking, false accusation. I'm just delighting in your pain. That's what that word means. 
Now, don't you think David would have been deeply wounded by people who were doing these kind of things to him? Of course. Like, if not, he wouldn't be human. Because this is part of our normal experience in life that when we see people try to take our life, they laugh at our pain, they mock us, that's going to hurt a little bit, right? In fact, it might hurt a lot. Yet still, in his pain, as he is being hurt, where did David turn? He turned to his God. He turned to Yahweh, to the one that he saw as his help, as his deliverer. He said, God, you are still that. Do you think David was angry? I'm sure he was at this point because He's probably righteously angry. These people weren't just attacking him. They were opposing God. So he's probably feeling this angst and some anger in it, but still he took it to the Lord. He left it in God's hands. He didn't try to take revenge. He didn't try to take matters into his own hands. He said, what does he say? God, you deliver me. God, you help me. You bring confusion in their minds. I can't do that. God, you turn them back in dishonor. I can't do that. Only you, God, are my help and my deliverer. Is that my perspective when I'm hurt? Like, do I immediately and fully take it to the Lord? Or do I try to be my own help, my own deliverer? A lot of the things we do in our lives when we're hurt, we might claim that we're bringing justice. But I'm afraid that most of the things that we do come from a heart of vengeance not from true righteous justice. There's actually a powerful scene in David's life. It's in 1 Samuel 24. We're going to start studying 1 Samuel this fall. But, but the first king, Saul, he was jealous of God's next king, David, and he was hunting David in the wilderness to try to kill him. Well, it just so happened that one day, David and his men were hiding very deep in a cave, and Saul and his men entered that cave to get out of the sun's heat. They didn't go as far back as David and his men were, but they were in the same cave. And I want you to listen to how this plays out. Keeping in mind what we just read in Psalm 70. This is 1 Samuel 24. It says, Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I'll give your enemy into your hand. You shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. And David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he'd cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. And David felt so guilty. And so David persuaded his men with these words, did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. And afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave, called after Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked back behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, hey, hey Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. Some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe did not kill you, you may know and see that there's no wrong or treason in my hands. I've not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. 
May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. You see that? David was hunted by Saul. An army of 3,000 men were coming after him to try to kill him. He was sent away from the city, living on the run, and what did he do? David trusted God. He trusted God. He said to Saul, it's the Lord's job to judge between us. It's the Lord's job to bring vengeance. It's not my job to take you out, Saul. That's God's work. It's not my job to do that. He had a heart absent of vengeance against this man who was trying to kill him. Listen, it takes a mature trust to leave your hurt in God's hands, to release your grip on it and and to give it to him. But if you see God as your help and your deliverer, that's how you can do that. David knew God's gonna take care of this. God's got this. I know I can release this. But here's the problem. That sounds easy. Of course, we can do that. The problem comes whenever that resolution takes longer than we think it should. That's why the third aspect of Psalm 70 is that God is still our help and our deliverer, even when he seems delayed. We learn that from David in Psalm 70, even when God seems delayed, he is our help and our deliverer. Remember how urgent David felt? Make haste, hurry up. God, they're right here. I need you now. But it also felt to him that God was delayed, that somehow God was not gonna come through for him. Listen, maybe that's where you're at right now. Maybe you see it in your own life, wondering if God's gonna resolve this, or maybe you see it in your kids' lives, or you see it in your friends, and like, God, when when are you gonna come through for them? You see these struggles, and it feels like God is absent, because that's really what it feels like, doesn't it? It feels like somehow God has clocked out of his job and he's moved on and he's just said, I'm, I'm done, eight to five, I'm done, right? And he's not even part of it anymore and it feels like everything is out of control. It feels like, is that true though? Now, theologically, we know that's not true. But experientially, it can certainly feel that way, can it? This is how Psalm 44 says it. Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and our oppression? Like, can't it feel like God's asleep at the wheel? (laughs) Or that he's hiding himself from us? Or that he's even worse, forgotten us? You look around at your life, the world, it's like, God, I'm questioning whether you're even real. That's why we have to come back to the truths of God's character in his word, reminding us who he is, what he's done. This is why we come back to it. We come back to what we've seen in the Old Testament already in Psalm 23, this famous Psalm that David wrote says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. 
Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. You, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen, if it feels like you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Those, those are all dark language words. And it feels like you're absent from God. It feels like he's gone from you. Listen, remember, if you are one of his sheep, then he is with you in the middle of all of it. Even if it seems like the darkness is lasting too long. If you are his sheep, he is your shepherd. And he never abandons his sheep. We've got to go back to the promises of his character in Psalm 23. Even in Hebrews 13, verse 5, says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's not saying that I'll leave you and forsake you at certain times, right? I will never. And when God says I will never do something, he will never do that. Not like you and me, we're wishy-washy. He will never abandon his people. So again, even though it might feel like he is delayed, I heard it said this way, God is never late and he's rarely early. He is always exactly right on time, his time. So the Lord is our help and our deliverer, even when we're needy, even when it hurts, even when it feels like he's delayed, he is our help and our deliverer. That's a glorious truth just to hang on to and to remind yourself and remind ourselves about. There's actually more here in Psalm 70 about who God is. When you look at Psalm 70, you look at verse four especially and you see something else. You see that he is also our glory and our joy. He is our help and our deliverer. We saw that in verse five. Verse four says he is our glory and our joy. Look again at verse four. It says, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. He is our joy, the one who makes us glad. And he is our glory, the one who is worthy of us proclaiming and displaying how great our God really is. This is our joy and our glory. And we want those things, don't we? Like I could poll every Christian I've ever met. Like we could walk around and talk to every Christian here, anywhere else. And we could ask them three questions. Do you want joy in God? Do you want to be glad in God? And do you want to give glory to God? Universally, yes to all of those, right? Like we want joy. We want to be glad in God. We want to give glory to God. That's part of being a Christian. But did you notice something about those questions here in verse 4? There were actually some conditions on getting those results, getting those outcomes that we want. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. So here's a couple questions I want to ask myself and us If we want those outcomes, a couple questions get us there. First, do we seek his presence? Do we seek his presence? I mean, what did David say? May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. So David knew 
that it was possible to have joy and gladness in God's presence, but he also knew that we have to seek the Lord to secure that joy and gladness. So do we? Do we seek an intimate relationship with him or do we instead just lament that we never feel close to him? That he feels absent from us? Now, let me be clear. There are times we know that the Lord allows us to go through dark nights of the soul, through storms in our lives, even when we're seeking him, even when we're following him. Yes, that happens. And there's also truth that sometimes our sin in ourself hides God from us. He didn't go anywhere, but we walked away, right? So there's, so there's, there's parts of this that, yes, we're going to feel some of those realities. But often, often we don't feel close to him because we're not really pursuing him. that we treat God more like an accessory to our lives rather than the core of our lives. That we're so distracted and we're more entertained by work or money or brawl stars or TikTok or whatever other things that we do, relationships, our bodies. We, we're so distracted, so more entertained by those kind of things and I wonder why I feel so dry at times. Like, I wonder why he feels far away at times. I wonder why I feel a lack of joy and gladness in him at times. I wonder why my needs overwhelm me, why my hurts consume me. While my, while my doubts rage against me. And I, I, I wonder about all those things. I'm questioning probably because I've sought my joy and my gladness in everything else but him. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And listen, even if that, Spurgeon said this, even if it starts in the darkness, <laughs> Hebrews 11 says that he rewards those who seek him. Light will come, maybe not soon, but light will come even in the darkness. But here's the reality of that. In some ways, that first question is dependent on the second question. Do we seek him? Do we seek his presence? Well, in some ways it's dependent, again, directly from verse four, this second question, do we love his salvation? Like, do we seek him for joy, for gladness in our lives? But it kind of hinges on this one. Do you love his salvation? Now, David's talking about this immediate deliverance. His enemies are pressing in. And so he's like, God, I need you to get me out of here. He would have rejoiced at that salvation. But as great as that can be to be delivered from enemies, to be delivered from hard situations, there's also the greater salvation that we can love eternally. It's what we talk about every week here. It's what we build our lives on. It's the gospel good news where Jesus lived the perfect law-abiding life that we could not live, where Jesus faced, you notice this in the, the story of the, the crucifixion, Jesus faced the same kind of ahas when he was crucified on the cross, people mocking him, looking at him, falsely accusing him, that David felt in some ways Jesus faced those same things while dying as our sin substitute on that cross, and then he rose again on the third day to defeat sin and death on that day that we couldn't do ourselves. See, that then 
leads to anyone who recognizes their sin against God, recognizes their need for Jesus' work in their place. What Jesus did means you can be saved from that sin. That's how the wrath of God that we deserve is transferred from them onto Christ. And what Christ does is he transfers his righteousness onto us. So we stand righteous before God forever. See, we call that the gospel, the good news. That's actually great news, isn't it? Do you love it? Do you love his salvation? If we do, if we truly love his salvation, then what verse four said here, he said, then we will forever say something. What did he say? You will forevermore, forever say what? God is great. Again, do we? Like, do we, do we so deeply love the salvation that Jesus offers us that I can't help but declare everywhere I go that God is great? His greatness in his sovereignty, his character, his provision for me, his greatness in his work in my place for salvation, his great promises of eternity with him forever and ever in the new heavens, and like the greatness of God. Because of his salvation. Do you love his salvation? Maybe a better question is this. Would those who know you best agree that the thing you love the most is salvation? Jesus. That's a little harder question, isn't it? Would those who know you best agree that that's what you love the most in your life? Or is it anything else? If it is anything else, that is the very definition of an idol. But I hope we see it today, church. I hope I see it more. I hope we see it more, church, that there is nothing more fulfilling, there's nothing more satisfying, there's nothing more thrilling than a close, intimate relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. Do you see how good he is? That he would never leave his children, never forsake his people, never abandon us in any situation, that he would do all that he did to save us. How great is our God? So here's what we're going to do. I want to invite the worship leaders to come back out now to help us lead toward exactly what this passage just said we're supposed to do. By the way, did you notice we were led first part of the service by a choir? What's the heading of verse 70? To the choir master, right? What does it say? To the choir master. Well, David wrote this so that the body could sing it together. Now, this is not the only choir here today, right? We are the choir. Every week, we are the choir singing the truths of God's word. That means we are to sing these things together. Here's the interesting thing. Joe said this during the week, this This to the choir master, meaning it's corporate. Look at all the I and me language throughout this. Like he's saying, you all should sing this, but use singular language, first person. Like what that means simply is that we are all in this together. We can sing this together because we're all in this together. And so again, in light of his goodness, in salvation especially, Here's what Psalm 30, David wrote this as well. Here's how it describes how our response should be. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth, clothed me with gladness. 
that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever.